Is Trump more or less negative than he was eight years ago? Oh, you're gonna get us into so much trouble. All right, has Trump changed his speaking style in the last eight years? This still sounds like such a biased question. It could be, but what if we could use a computer to try to analyze his words? How would that work? What if we took his inauguration speech in 2017 and compared it to his speech in 2025? What would that tell us? We could compare his word choice, reading level, and even do sentiment analysis on his speeches. Sentiment analysis? That's the process of scoring how positive or negative a piece of text is. Oh, that will definitely be biased. What if we have an AI do the scoring? Huh? In this video, I downloaded the transcripts from both of Trump's inaugural speeches and processed them to find the answers to these questions. I even compared them to the results I found from other presidential re-election speeches to see if history repeats itself. But enough talk, more data! It's data time! I'm data. In a previous video, I downloaded all presidential inauguration speeches and compared them to each other. I gave extra attention to re-election speeches to see if presidents changed their speaking style over time. Aren't inauguration speeches written by speechwriters and not the presidents themselves? Yes, but I think it's still a good indicator of changing sentiments within an administration. Won't this analysis be biased? Well, the hope is that using a computer to do most of the analysis will help reduce that problem. Do you have any unconscious biases? None that I'm aware of. Huh? Before looking at Trump's words, let's look at another president who is uniquely similar to Trump. Similar to Trump? Trump was voted out of office and then back into office. That's only ever happened one other time in US history. Who else did that happen to? Grover Cleveland. Who? In 1884, New York Governor Grover Cleveland decided to run for president and won. Then, in 1888, former Indiana Senator Benjamin Harrison challenged Cleveland for president and he won. Then, in 1892, Cleveland ran for office again and defeated Harrison. This makes Cleveland the only president to serve two non-consecutive terms as president until now. Why does that matter? Because in my previous video, when I looked at second inaugural speeches, I found some interesting anomalies with Cleveland that I want to test out with Trump. Are Cleveland and Trump that similar? I didn't think so until I did some more research about Cleveland. Cleveland was from New York and known for fighting corruption in Washington. Sound familiar? By today's standards, Cleveland would probably be considered a libertarian who wanted to lower taxes and reduce the size of the federal government, except for the military, which he wanted to modernize. Sound familiar? Stop that. Then, in 1888, Benjamin Harrison challenged Cleveland in a campaign that was very intense and close. There were even accusations of Harrison's party buying votes in swing states. Ultimately, Harrison defeated Cleveland, who didn't even win his home state of New York. Harrison had a rough term and wasn't sure if he should run again, but decided to anyhow. Ultimately, Cleveland beat him this time around. They're like the same person. Ah, uh, I don't know about that. They had their differences too. Like what? Well, probably the biggest difference was that Cleveland was strongly opposed to increasing tariffs. Opposed to them? That's right. Remember, Cleveland was more of a libertarian, and as such, he was a big advocate for free trade. On the other hand, Harrison was the one that wanted to increase tariffs. <sighs> I don't know what to think anymore. I'm also cutting out a ton of other facts about them that didn't seem to be relevant. I just mentioned Cleveland because he's gonna come up again when we start to analyze Trump's speeches. Okay, but even if you analyze his words, you're still gonna be biased in your analysis. Well. Let's first start with something simple, the length of Trump's speech. Trump's speech was one of the longest inaugurations we've had in some time. His speech was over 2,800 words long. In fact, it's the longest we've had since Herbert Hoover's speech in 1919. More interestingly, it is much longer than his first inaugural speech eight years ago. That speech was only 1,400 words long. That's a 98% increase. That's almost twice as long. That is the longest increase of any second inauguration speech in US history. For comparison, the president with the next largest increase was Bill Clinton, and his re-election speech was only 35% longer than his first. Okay, I guess that sounds pretty impartial, but it doesn't say anything about the speaker. Fine, what if we analyze Trump's reading level using the Fletch Kincaid grade level? What? The Fletch Kincaid grade level is a formula to estimate what grade level a person is speaking at. Basically, it just calculates how many syllables each word has and how many words each sentence has. Speakers who use bigger words and longer sentences score higher. What if we examine how Trump's reading level has changed in eight years? This sounds like it could be biased. Well, let's just see. 
For Trump's first inauguration, he spoke between a 7th and 8th grade reading level. For comparison, during his second inauguration, he spoke between a 9th and 10th grade reading level. So he increased his reading level? That's right. In fact, that's been true for all modern presidents. If we look back at all presidents who were re-elected in the past 50 years, each of them increased their reading level for their second inauguration. Eh, reading level doesn't mean anything. You said it's just counting syllables and words, which isn't anything special. Okay. What if we examine how often Trump refers to himself? You mean to see how selfish he is? Well, not necessarily. Oh, this is gonna be totally biased. No, come on, this won't be totally biased. Stop copying me! This is such an echo chamber. That's not even what that term means. How can we trust anything we hear? Well, it certainly can be difficult to trust information in this landscape of growing polarization. Misinformation through unchecked platforms can degrade the trust people have in mainstream journalism. That's why for this video, I'm partnering with Ground News. Ugh, I don't need yet another news outlet in my life. Ground News isn't a news outlet, but rather a nonpartisan app built to aggregate and categorize existing news articles, reporting on the political leanings of each article. Huh? Here's an example of a story I saw recently about Mexico refusing a U.S. military flight deporting migrants. Ground News found 26 articles on this story and grouped them together by political leanings. You can find a summary for the left, center, and right, or read individual articles. You can even see here the overall statistics of the articles. 30% of the sources lean left, 25% center, and 45% right. They're so evenly split. Yes, but that's not always the case. In fact, there is a special feature in the app called Blind Spot, which shows you stories that were heavily reported on by one side, but not the other. Here we see a story about how Republicans are introducing a bill that aims to protect parental rights. 83% of the articles came from right-wing sources, but 0% came from left-wing sources. While on the other side of the spectrum, we have a story about scientists expressing concern over the impact of policies on scientific research. Here we have 33% of the articles coming from left-wing sources, and no articles coming from right-wing sources. Wait. You're saying there are some stories that are just not reported on at all by one side or another? Sometimes omission is the strongest indicator of bias. Talk about omission bias. That's not what that term means, but yes, I think you see my point. If you're someone who respects data and wants to break out of polarizing echo chambers, then Ground News is definitely for you. Go to ground.news slash data time or scan my QR code in order to get 40% off the same vantage plan that I have. This brings the cost down to around $5 a month. You could even gift this to someone who also wants a more impartial understanding of their world. Using my link to sign up for Ground News will not only ensure bias doesn't dictate your life, but you'll also be supporting my channel. Now, are we gonna be all done complaining about bias? All right, fine. Let's now take a look how often Trump refers to himself. I counted how many times Trump uses first-person pronouns in his speech. Words like I, me, and my. Nearly 2% of Trump's words are first-person pronouns. Meh, that's not a lot. That's higher than you might think. The average for an inauguration speech is closer to 1.5%, and it's especially high compared to his first speech of just 0.27%. That's an absolute increase of 1.6%. That's the largest increase in self-references of any president except Washington. And the only reason Washington's is so high is because his re-election speech was only four sentences long, so all of his percentages are messed up. And guess which president had the next largest increase? Grover Cleveland. <sighs> He's back. That's right. Wait, so does Trump use these pronouns more than all other presidents? Not at all. For comparison, Trump's 1.87% isn't that high when compared to Biden's 3% use of personal pronouns. And that is actually one of the highest rates for any inauguration speech. Eh, I don't care about first person pronouns. I wanna know his most common words spoken. People always ask me for that, and it's honestly not that interesting since the most popular words for everyone are usually the, a, to. No, I mean like real words. So. In a previous video, someone suggested I use the formula term frequency inverse document frequency. What's that? Basically, it looks for words that are frequently used by a speaker that are not used by other speakers. So if Trump says a word frequently that other presidents don't say frequently, then it'll be scored higher? Exactly. Let's take a look at these top words. For Trump's first speech, his top word is America. No surprise there. But what is surprising is that only half of all presidents use that word in their speeches, and most of them were only in the last century. In fact, the word America hardly shows up in any inauguration speeches before the 20th century. For clarity, the word American does show up in most inauguration speeches. His next top word is Obama. Obama? Yeah, I was surprised by that too. I bet he criticizes Obama a lot in the speech. No. He just thanks the Obamas a few times at the beginning of the speech. President Obama, and we are grateful to President Obama 
And First Lady Michelle Obama. So he only says Obama three times, and that makes it a top word? Yes. That's because he is the only president to say it in a speech. There are only two inaugural speeches that contain the word Obama, and both of them are Trump speeches. Didn't Biden think Obama in his speech? No, Biden didn't think any former presidents in his speech, only current politicians. Did Biden think Trump? No, but Trump didn't even attend Biden's inauguration, so take that as you will. Trump's next top word is dreams, followed by jobs, then everyone, then trillions. Now, let's look at the top words of his second inauguration. Here, his top word is thank. That seems pretty common. Actually, only about a quarter of inauguration speeches contain that word. A quarter? Yeah. And those were only in the last century. In fact, Dwight D. Eisenhower was the first president ever to actually say thank you in an inauguration speech. And with prayer to Almighty God, my citizens, I thank you. Trump's next top word is going, then Panama, which interestingly hasn't appeared in an inauguration speech since 1909 when William Howard Taft mentioned it. Next is back, then McKinley, and finally, America. Trump loves saying America. To be fair, America is also one of the top words in Biden's inauguration speech. Okay, but you asked if Trump was more negative now compared to eight years ago. None of this tells us that. Right. Let's now take a look at the sentiment analysis of Trump's speeches. In a previous video, I used OpenAI to process all of the inaugural speeches and asked the AI to provide the sentiment analysis of each speech according to positivity and negativity on a scale from zero to 100%. Trump's first inauguration speech from 2017 had a positivity score of 71% and a negativity score of 26%. Comparing that negativity score to other presidents, we can see that this was the sixth most negative speech of all time. This was the most negative speech in over a hundred years since Woodrow Wilson's speech in 1913. However, the second inauguration speech was even more negative, scoring at nearly 33% negative. This is the second most negative speech of all time after Wilson's speech. But more interestingly, this speech has an increase in negativity from the first one of almost 6%. If we compare this increase in negativity to previous presidents, we can see that this is the first time in 50 years that a president's second speech increased in negativity. Most of the presidents who did increase their negativity during their second term were presidents in the 19th century. In fact, if we want to find a president who increased their negativity by more than Trump's, we have to go all the way back to Grover Cleveland. He won't go away. Cleveland only had a negativity score of 8% for his first inauguration, but that increased to 31% for his second inauguration. That's an absolute increase of 23%. That's the largest increase in negativity of any president's second inauguration speech in US history. Similarly, if we look at Trump's change in positivity, we see that his score dropped from 71% to 66%. That still seems pretty high. There hasn't been a speech that low since FDR's first inauguration speech nearly 100 years ago. That had a positivity score of 65%, and that was during the Depression. Okay, but you can't trust an AI to do meaningful sentiment analysis. It doesn't understand the subtleties of English. Well, let's find out. I asked the AI to provide the three most positive excerpts from his speech. This is what it returned. America will soon be greater, stronger, and far more exceptional than ever before. National unity is now returning to America, and confidence and pride is soaring like never before. We are one people, one family, and one glorious nation under God. So to every parent who dreams for their child and every child who dreams for their future, I am with you, I will fight for you, and I will win for you. I also asked the AI to provide his three most negative excerpts. Our country can no longer deliver basic services in times of emergency as recently shown by the wonderful people of North Carolina been treated so badly and other states who are still suffering from a hurricane that took place many months ago or more recently Los Angeles where we're watching fires still tragically burn from weeks ago without even a token of defense. We have a public health system that does not deliver in times of disaster, yet more money is spent on it than any country anywhere in the world. After years and years of illegal and unconstitutional federal efforts to restrict free expression, I will also sign an executive order to immediately stop all government censorship and bring back free speech to America. Wait. The AI thought the last one was one of his most negative excerpts? He's talking about ending censorship and bringing back free speech. Shouldn't that at least be somewhat positive? Yeah, 
I'm not certain. The first part of the sentence does sound negative, talking about unconstitutional efforts, but I would think talking about freedom of speech should be somewhat positive. This sounds like AI bias. Why don't we ask the AI to explain itself? Can you please provide the sentiment analysis of this text? The sentiment of the provided text appears to be generally negative towards the actions of the federal government, as it describes the efforts as illegal and unconstitutional and mentions government censorship. This language suggests a feeling of dissatisfaction or disapproval regarding past governmental actions. However, the text also contains a positive aspect in the latter part, as it promises to bring back free speech to America, which implies a hopeful or optimistic outlook towards future actions and outcomes. Therefore, the overall sentiment can be considered mixed, with negative feelings toward past and current situations, but positive intentions for the future. It thinks the quote is mixed. It does sort of seem to understand nuance. Then why did the AI say it's one of his most negative quotes? I'm not certain. Comment below what you think about the AI's analysis. I should also mention, I left out a ton of other stuff that I asked the AI, none of which seemed to make much sense or just wasn't that interesting. So my own biases could definitely have affected the outcome of this video. Can you be conscious of unconscious bias? At any rate, if you're interested in hearing more about my process for making these videos or other updates about the channel, you should definitely subscribe to my newsletter where I post things that I don't talk about in my videos. But you didn't answer your real question about Trump. My real question? How has Trump changed his speaking style in eight years? Ah, well, that was one question that I was able to get from the AI. If I give you two speeches from the same speaker, can you analyze each speech and let me know if you think the speaker has changed as a person? The AI said it could, and when I gave it both of Trump's speeches, this is what it had to say. In summary, while there are many thematic continuities between the two, the speaker has shown some evolution in approach and rhetoric. The second speech appears to be more detailed and specific, reflecting a response to opposition and challenges faced while in or seeking office again. The personal tone and anecdotes also hint at a more personally resilient narrative. This could suggest not necessarily a fundamental change as a person, but a reaction to the broader political landscape's changing dynamics and the personal challenges experienced. Is that response biased? I don't know. Comment below what you think.